All right, this lecture covers Thomas Nagel's article, Poverty and Food, Why Charity is Not Enough. Um, this is thematically related to the Peter Singer article we uh, are also covering this week. Um, remember Singer's article, Famine, Affluence, and Morality. Um, they both have things to say about charity, and they both, both Nagel and Singer, have arguments that have implications for well, how we understand charity. Um, and they're also both focused on basically similar, well, pretty much the same problem, um, basically massive poverty, life-threatening poverty, the type of poverty you find with, associated with famines and starvation. Uh, uh, Nagel is primarily concerned with starvation and just lack of food. Um, but they're both going to approach this problem in slightly different ways. Um, and they're going to look at it from different angles, and they're also going to apply slightly different moral reasoning to it. Um, so let's just kind of dive right in. Um, first, let's just kind of narrow, look at, um, explore how Nagel narrows the focus of this topic. Um, he's focusing on the justice of current food distributions, and he's going to frame questions of current global inequalities in terms of food. Well, why not frame it in terms of health care or military or, I don't know, certain types of political freedoms or um, uh, other types of, I don't know, goods, for example? Well, mainly because food is about as basic as it gets. I mean, what's the point of having a great health care system if you have no food to eat? What's the point of having an iPhone or political freedoms or... Uh, you know, massive amounts of money in your bank account if you can't eat. Um, so basically food, while Nagel grants it, it can be exchanged monetarily. And it's connected to other systems of exchange. Um, and it's possible then to frame the problem of global inequalities in terms of other goods. Nagel's going to grant that, but what Nagel says is this. Food is basic. It is the last thing an individual can afford to give up if he can afford nothing else. And this means that in the current world situation, we are not dealing with an abstract problem of inequality, but with something more specific and acute. So again, it's that whole, if, you know, food's just, you know, if you don't have that, then you really don't have much else. Um, you know, here's an analogy. Take a billionaire. Uh, I don't know, like Bill Gates or one of the Koch brothers or Warren Buffett. Drop them off in the middle of the desert. Um, doesn't matter how much money is in their bank account if they don't get access to water. It, uh, money in their bank account doesn't no good. Um, so he's gonna, he's just going to get back to the basics. Um, okay. So granted, though, there are other, he's going to grant that there are other inequalities, such as, for example, there's this, this disparity in the United States between the wealthiest 1% and then the bottom, say, 10%. Uh, go to Gary, Indiana, and then compare that to some of the wealthy neighborhoods in, like, uh, well, I don't know, Manhattan, for example. Uh, obviously, there's a huge disparity of uh, income and wealth, and there's great inequalities there. And perhaps those inequalities are also unjust. Uh, um, but, Nagel writes, but whatever may be said about this general problem, the inequalities that appear in the distribution of food on a worldwide scale are of a very different kind and raise a different issue. Um, so, again, Nagel's not going to say that the disparities of income, for example, say in the United States, aren't bad. Uh, for example, in terms of access to health care. Or the, um, he's just going to say that the issue he's focused on, where some people just aren't getting enough food to live, that's a different kind of moral issue than, say, you know, some people can afford cars and some people can't. Um, so, uh, he says it's different in kind. So, here's a question. Why couldn't it just be a difference in degree, just to a much greater degree? So, for example, I am most of you at Purdue. The fact that you're undergraduates at a Big Ten university in the United States means that you're at least high in socioeconomic status. Now, I'm not saying that you have a lot of money in your bank account. There's the socio aspect of socioeconomic. But the fact that you're getting college degrees means that you're much more likely to have a greater income than people that don't. Um However, there are some people who get to go to Harvard just because their parents write big checks to Harvard. They're going to have even greater opportunities than you. Doesn't that make you jealous? Nagel would meet you there. He'd say, yeah, it's probably, maybe it's not fair that some people get to go to Harvard and have much better career opportunities just because their parents wrote a check. It's not like you get to choose your parents. But 
as bad as that is, it's not nearly as bad as the fact that some people are starving while others have plenty to eat. So that's what he's focusing on. It's the most salient example of, I guess, what Nagel's going to ultimately argue is an unjust inequality. Um, so inequalities in, in food are in a different moral class from inequalities on a higher scale, such as the disparity between those who can afford yachts and those who cannot, or those who can afford a car, those and those who cannot. So I'm kind of just reiterating the same point. For those of you who are curious, I don't know why I picked this, but the picture on the left is just two dudes, tourists in China, walking the Great Wall. And the picture on the right is Justin Bieber having a horde of his handlers carry him because he doesn't want to do the hard work of walking the Great Wall himself. Uh, yeah, so that's an example of an inequality that is not on the same moral scale as people who can't afford to eat meat and who are starving and who are probably going to die. Um, which, I mean, I won't go into the statistics. We've already covered that in the um, first week of this class, and that stuff's all in the World Wide Webs. But, I mean, people are dying daily. So high numbers of people are dying daily because of lack of access to basically food all right so nagel's article hinges on this concept or this principle or this thesis or notion of radical inequality um he's gonna have a he's gonna use that in his argument in fact he's gonna morally appraise radical inequality but before we get to nagel's moral appraisal of radical inequality it's helpful to see how he defines it so we'll first we'll quote nagel Nagel writes, and I quote, a radical inequality exists when the bottom level is one of direst need, the top level one of great comfort or even luxury, and the total supply is large enough to raise the bottom above the level of extreme need without bringing significant deprivation to those above, specifically without reducing most people to a place somewhat above the current bottom or otherwise radically reducing their standard of living. Um, so I parse this out. Uh... And I, I, in my opinion, the much more neater, logically tighter definition uh, of what radical inequality is. So, we'll say, for any situation S, S is a situation of radical inequality if and only if, one, those at the bottom level of S are in direst need. So basically, like, starvation. Uh, two, those at the top level of S live a life of great comfort and luxury. And three, the total supply is large enough to raise the bottom above the level of extreme need without bringing significant deprivation to those above. It est without reducing most people to a position only slightly better than the current bottom. So that's the definition. It's basically got three criteria. Uh, and when these three criteria are satisfied, one to three, then you have a situation of radical inequality. Um, so this... Definition, it's important to note that this just describes the size of the gap between the top and the bottom, as well as the available total and the level of the bottom. So it could be that the people at the bottom, there's a huge gap between the bottom and the top, for example. So there's a huge gap between the top 1% and the bottom 1%, but the top 1% aren't dying of starvation. Their level of living is significantly higher. Um, maybe they have plenty of food, maybe they have some basic health care. Even though there's still a huge gap. So this notion of radical inequality doesn't, um, those people would not satisfy that definition. It also emphasizes the available total. The basically the amount of goods available for distribution. So, I mean, there are situations of scarcity where there just simply aren't enough resources to go to everyone. There is just, so for example, when there's a life-threatening disease spreading, but there's a shortage of medicine. So sad but true, but not everyone can get access to it. In this situation of radical inequality, there is enough goods. So he's focusing on certain types of situations. So, I don't know, for example, in discussion board posts, don't bring up situations where there is a huge gap between the bottom and the top, but the bottoms are all right. They're not dying of starvation. Also, don't bring up situations where there's a scarcity, where the reason there's this inequality is just because there aren't enough resources, because that's not what Nagel's interested in, okay? He's not focused on that. Um, and he's going to also argue that there are situations that do satisfy this notion of radical inequality in the world right now, today. Um, two, I note that the distribution of the world's food supply is actually one such case of radical inequality, according to Nagel. Basically, there is, in fact, enough food on Earth right now to feed everyone, 
so that no one dies of starvation. Um, he wrote this a while ago. That is still true today. Um, that's not really a lesson for a philosophy class. It's something for, I don't know, an economics class or an agricultural class. But um, a lot of different people I've talked to in economics and other fields have agreed, though. Yeah, there's actually enough food to feed everyone today. So the question is, why are people still starving? And there's a lot of factors involved. War, famine, there's political reasons. Uh, but the fact is, there is, in fact, plenty of food on Earth right now. Plenty of fresh water on Earth right now to feed everyone. Um, for example, a lot of it goes towards feeding cattle. Uh, but, I mean, anyways, we won't go into that, though. So that's kind of an indisputable fact. All right. Now, I know... Now, I'm not saying that your instructor agrees with Nagel's argument in this article, but I do note that Nagel's definition of radical inequality does have some benefits. First off, it does actually offer a principled answer to the question, where do you draw the line? Like, when is, you know, what is it going to take for, you know, how much inequality is okay? You know, um... It, uh, well, here, so for example, conservatives might object to Nagel and say, you know, you'll never be happy until everyone's completely equal and you're living in this Marxist utopia. And Nagel would say, no, in fact, I don't draw the line at any inequality whatsoever. I draw the line at radical inequality. And I've got a principled way to do that, that any rational being, according to Nagel, should agree with. Okay. The second point is, and it's related to the first is, Nagel's notion of radical inequality lays aside the worry or counter-argument that declaring inequality is immoral entails a dreary Marxist world where everyone's standard of living is just minimally adequate. Yeah, for example, no one's starving, but that's about it. Um, so, um, economics lesson. A fully centralized government, which has been experimented in several countries in the 20th century, has had its setbacks. Um, a fully centralized government where you don't rely on free market notions at all whatsoever, where instead of like letting the market tell you, uh, let you guess demand and then have supply kind of meet that accordingly, instead you have like a centralized government office try to guess what demand will be and then make supply on that. Doesn't work. Um, so the, the example what, that economists all often point to is Soviet Union, uh, where Instead of like kind of letting the market determine how much rolls of toilet paper or bread you needed to satisfy the populace for a week, you would have these people and these bureaucrats try to use these calculations to tally how much is needed and produce that much accordingly. And in case there was always shortages and people were having to wait in long lines for basic stuff like bread, and then they say, see, communism or socialism doesn't work. Um, of course, they sometimes take it a lot farther. They say any government involvement whatsoever in the market or in the economy, any type of regulation or any type of centralization is the exact same thing as like what Soviet Russia was like in the 20th century. That uh, is probably a lot more. That's a bit more of a stretch. It's kind of fallacious, actually. It's, just, it's like a straw man. Uh, but they are right about some types of market systems that have been experimented with that have not succeeded. Um, or at least so. That is one example. Well, this doesn't apply to Nagel's argument. He's not arguing. His argument doesn't entail that you know the only that all inequality is bad, and it also doesn't entail that you need this dreary Marxist world, for example. Um, okay. Now I sometimes have students that had families in that part of the world during that time who sometimes offer, um, you know, counterexamples to that claim and. You're right, it wasn't always like that, but there were times where it was like that, and the cause of that, you can draw a direct causal connection, was that economic setup. So, um, anyways, so here's an objection, and here's an objection. Nagel's definition doesn't tell us what to do about radical inequality. So, Nagel has got this definition of radical inequality, but that's so what? It's good for nothing. What are we supposed to do about it, okay? That's kind of how the objection goes. We hear this often in other political debates. Someone says, X is wrong, and then their opponent goes, all you do is point out what's wrong, but until you can point out what's right, we don't have to listen to you. Or what? until you tell us what to do about it, we shouldn't even have to bother listening to you. That's kind of what the opponent says. I see this all the time in political discourse. Um, well, my response is, first off, who cares? 
Um, and this isn't a point about my political beliefs, which I purposely conceal from my students. Instead, it's a point about logic. It's just I don't think the argument succeeds as a philosopher or as a logician, a guy who studies the structure of good and bad arguments and gets paid for it. I'm a professional, damn it. Don't mess with me. Uh, so um, let me clarify. Let's just recast the argument in, um, in a way that a, a logician would deal with it. So here it goes. Premise one. Nagel's definition of radical inequality doesn't suggest a solution to radical inequality. Conclusion, therefore, Nagel's definition of radical inequality is false. That argument is akin to arguing. So, so uh, here's another example. It's like a similar type of argument. This is to show that it's fallacious. So, so-and-so's criteria for a polluted river doesn't suggest how to clean the river. Therefore, so-and-so's criteria for a polluted river is false. Of course, you don't need to have a solution for how to clean a river to know that the river is polluted. Or you don't need to have a solution for curing a disease to properly diagnose that someone has a disease. Well, the same applies with Nagel's notion of radical inequality. You don't have to have a solution to radical inequality to have a definition that points it out and marks it out. Okay, and That's all Nagel's doing at this stage. Okay, So that objection, which I think was mentioned in Nagel's article, but might be brought up. I don't think that objection succeeds. So how is Nagel going to cast it from? Well, first, he will not argue that the injustice of inequality is based on the injustice of wrongdoing. So for example, suppose the inequalities right now in the world that resulting in people dying of starvation was, all of it was traceable to like uh, criminal actions on the behalf of the wealthy. Well, in that case, the, the solution would be kind of straightforward in a sense. But he's not going to assume that. He's going to assume that perhaps all of the radical inequality was not caused by factors like that. Either. He's also So instead, the injustice of inequality is going to be consistent with there being no wrongdoing on anyone's part. He's going to assume that. Okay, That is, there's, he's going to argue that there's still something wrong with radical inequality, even if the inequality did not arise from wrongdoing. Nagel writes, and I quote, there is something wrong, in other words, with an international market economy in which many people are malnourished while many others live high, when there is enough productive capacity to feed everyone adequately. There is something wrong even if nobody is stealing from anyone else, and even if the inequalities are results automatically from the influence of supply and demand which can produce inequalities of wealth that result in inequalities of distribution. Okay. Um, so what is he challenging then? Well, he's going to challenge the following. One, individuals or companies or nations have the right to accumulate wealth and property and trade with others on whatever terms are mutually acceptable, letting the chips fall wherever they may. He's going to challenge that. He's also going to challenge. So Nagel writes, the position I want to defend is that even if it doesn't involve anyone's doing anything wrong, the system that permits this outcome is still morally objectionable. So that's what Nagel's challenging then. He's challenging the system, okay? He's making a moral judgment, an evaluative judgment about the system. Not individuals or companies or players within the system, the system itself. Um, so, what about charity then? Why can't charity just fix this radical inequality? Which, you know, charity doesn't require radical revisions to our system. It happens all the time with it. Well, Nagel's not going to agree with you on that point. So assuming the immorality of systems that sustain radical inequality, then why not just have charity deal with it? Well, for a few reasons. One, according to Nagel, charity is limited in what it can achieve. Um, so one potential response is that if that's true, it's only contingently true. So it just so happens that charity has been limited in the past in what it has actually achieved. Does that necessarily follow that it's limited by the nature of charity in itself in what it can achieve? Um, and his next point partially addresses this worry. Um, worse, Nagel's going to challenge what charity presupposes. So charity's not threatening to those who voluntarily give because it is up to those who give to determine the level of sacrifice they're willing to make, and charity does not question the entitlement to goods of those who give. Um... So reasons like these then explain why people are perfectly happy to donate money to natural disaster victims. Because natural disasters don't cast doubt 
on the right of those who haven't lost property to that property. If your tornado takes out your neighbor's house, but it doesn't take out your house, you don't question your right to your own house, all right? Natural disasters don't cause that. But radical economic inequalities are not like the results of natural disasters. For unjust social institutions do not produce the inequality of natural disasters. Um, so Nagel writes, an appeal to charity is a solution, but to this implied refusal to challenge the legitimacy of the system of property under which the donors of charity hold title to their possessions tends to obscure this need. So then going back to that first challenge, um, that it's only contingently true that charity is limited. Well, maybe it's not merely contingently true. If charity is meant to solve the problem that a, uh, I guess, corrupt system created to begin with, charity is going to allow that corrupt system to continue to have corrupt outcomes. Um, so it's, um, it, and at the same time, charity is going to assume the legitimacy of this corrupt system. All right. So Nagel thinks you need something stronger than just charity, basically. Uh, you need something that just basically you need a revision of the system. So, as I said before, Nagel's argument is an evaluation of systems of property. You can negatively evaluate a system of property even if the haves acquired their property in ways justifiable within the system. All right. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, take the example of a billionaire that acquired his wealth by stealing it through a Ponzi. Ponzi scheme. Um, he would be a billionaire who broke the law within a certain system of property. So you, you wouldn't make a negative appraisal of the system. Instead, you'd make a negative appraisal of the billionaire who acquired wealth illegally, right? And, you know, Bernie Madoff is an example of one such billionaire, and he's now in prison. So that's an example of a negative appraisal made within the rules of the system. All right. But Nagel, though, isn't critiquing that. He's, critique, he's saying that you can also critique the system. Right. So take a different example, such as a system in which some can get very rich while others inevitably are left with next to nothing, simply because of the way the system is set up. Well, those who get rich do so without violating the rules of the system. So the critique then of the rich would not be by appeals to rules within the system. Instead, you'd have to critique the system itself. Um, and we see this, for example, libertarians critique socialist economic systems or systems with high taxation is unjust because they view the lack of ownership or high taxation as theft. So libertarians, for example, critique the system because you can't critique a Marxist system uh, as being unjust because of it's like theft with the rules of Marxism itself. You can't, you know, you can't use the rules of the game to change the game, basically. You have to change, you have to challenge the rules of the game itself. Um, Nagel who's more fiscally to the left, would also critique the libertarian's ideal system. Um, I guess we'll give his critique real quick. It's very Rawlsian. Um, I think Nagel's article is heavily influenced by Rawls. In fact, if you remember the first or second week where he read Rawls, and we talked about the veil of ignorance, um, the original position and the principles of justice, for example. Um, so Nagel writes, I believe that the provision by sovereign states of a social minimum for their citizens is justified by the fact that morally arbitrary factors can exert so powerful and negative influence on people's lives in the absence of such a policy. So examples of morally arbitrary factors that nevertheless influence how successful you'll be would be like your natural endowment, such as just being born smart or good looking or athletic, your family influence, having healthy upbringing or having wealthy parents, or just access to resources. Uh, Nagel would say the appropriate remedy isn't an exhortation to charity then, but a revision of the system of property rights to remove its objectionable features. Um, well, some libertarians would object. Well, redistribution just is theft. You're taking what we earned and giving it to someone else. That's theft. Uh, sorry, drinking my coffee. The tea party. Uh, you hear that now often from tea partiers, okay? That's why they're objecting to a lot of uh, policies right now. Um, Nagel seems aware of that. So he writes, from the point of view I'm, I'm advocating, it's an attempt to build into the conditions of exchange, accumulation, and possession certain safeguards that prevent them from being unjust. Within the U.S., for example, 
a system that permitted one-fourth of the population to starve while the rest were well off would be regarded as unacceptable even if this result arose without coercion or theft by non-fraudulent economic transactions. Uh, so he's saying if such a system were in place that had these results, well, it's still an unjust system. Um, so the possibility that Nagel continues of such a result would generally be taken to undermine the legitimacy of the system and therefore indirectly the legitimacy of possessions held under it. So here's an important point. Nagel acknowledges that the possessions would be legal. He just doesn't think they would be morally legitimate. Um, and he gives the analogy of a system of majority rule would be morally illegitimate if it permitted horrendous persecution against minorities. So um, earlier in the semester, I talked about the difference between what is legal and what is moral. And the point I made was that what is legal is not necessarily moral and vice versa. Don't assume that what's legal maps on what's moral. Um, Nagel's assuming that. Because uh, oftentimes there, um, you know, racism, I'm sorry, slavery used to be legal. Uh, but it's definitely immoral, right? Okay, so he's saying systems that have these types of unequal outcomes where the 1% are like literally dying. Even if there's no theft or whatever by the top, people at the top, they're still not morally legitimate. All right, so what he's going to do is he's going to extend this to the world economy. So the world economy is a system. Countries trade and interact with each other. Actions in one country impact the citizens of many other countries um, and vice versa, especially the actions of affluent countries. Uh, and that's undeniable, especially with globalism. Um, so Nagel's going to argue that the world economy is one of radical inequality. So this, and this situation cannot be resolved via charity. So instead, he's going to prefer internal conditions on the international economy. Well, there's a problem then. Who would impose such conditions? Uh, <laughs> I make a joke, the United Nations, because the joke is generally that they don't do anything. Uh, at least they're not very powerful. They're impotent. Um, I think that's a joke. Um, I'm not saying I actually believe that. Um, Nagel has some thoughts. He says it won't be done unless the wealthy countries decide that an improvement in the economic condition of the rest of the world is to their advantage, or at least that it will not cost them much. This is a risky proposition, for any reform that benefits the poor will impact the wealthy. Uh, and there are several consequences of this. First, one cannot take us beyond challenge. Um, sorry. Several consequences of Nagel's argument, then. Um, he doesn't offer much of a solution, I note. Which I brought up before that this is not an objection to his argument. Uh, I grant, it would be nice if he had something more solid to say about what we should do. He doesn't. But that does not, should not be taken as an objection to his notion of radical inequality. There are objections. I think our discussion board assignment this week will bring up an objection, and I'm going to be curious to see what you all have to say about it. Uh, but just, I want to note a few more implications of extending Nagel's argument to the world economy. One, one cannot take as beyond challenge anymore the fact that each nation owns what it produces and what can buy in the open market, and that therefore what we have is ours to decide what to do with. Instead, it should be directed to the impoverished simply because of their humanity, not because of some relation they have to the donor. For example, the donor caused the poverty. Uh, that's one implication of his notion of radical inequality. Okay. That's basically it. Uh, all right.